Okay, let me. Uh... This meeting is being recorded. Okay, so I'm gonna try to. Oh, huh? I cannot. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, when uh, when you're ready, I'm gonna try to share my slides. Yep, we're gonna start at uh, nine oh five or so to let people start filtering in. Cool, cool. Okay, let me let me try to share the slides. Uh, I, I can't I can't share screen yet. Um, Oh, see. apologies. One moment. Uh, I have to fix that. Um, I'll purchase it. There you go. Now you can share your screen. Okay. Let me try. Let me share this. Okay. Here's the screen. I'm going to try the full screen mode. Okay. So this is full screen. And here's the first video. Can you see the video? Yep. We can see the video. Please. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Let me. Let me exit. So, like, because uh, I'm doing Zoom over the browser, I'm not going to see anyone or the audience. So, if there's any, uh, if you need to interrupt me, uh, you can just interrupt me uh, by speaking uh, yep. during. I can keep an eye on the chat as well for, for you. Hey, you there, Luis? Yep. Let me see. Yep, I'm here. Just uh, trying to make sure people filter into the correct place. Hello, hello. Hi. Okay. Yep. Okay, I can hear you now. For some reason, I had the audio cut off. Maybe the, the Q and A, uh, if possible, it could be better after the talk. Uh, because of the web browser situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh man. Are we uh, recording today? We are. Cool. David, what, what time is it for you? Just out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, it's a good time. It's 10 p.m. So the, <laughs> the kids, the kids are just all asleep. So this oh. is actually uh, some of the, the best times for me to do talks and good. like good. chat with other people and, and actually work. <laughs> okay, good. Good. I'm glad that it lines yeah. up well. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for organizing this, guys. Oh, we should post on uh, Twitter that the talk has started. One second. Let me um, announcement. There we go. And then let me make sure people in my lab want to join join okay i think uh we can start at this point okay um okay sure yeah let's see let me load my slides. Okay, so I'm gonna start, okay? Sounds good. So, hello. Uh, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, we, we should record. We are recording. Okay, oh, so just okay. let me know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, so I'm gonna start my talk. Yeah, thanks guys. Uh, uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is David Ha, 
And today I'm going to give a talk about a topic that really excites me, uh, which is about collective intelligence and how it can be used to improve AI, uh, specifically deep learning. So let's begin. So if you've been following the developments in machine learning over the past few years, you probably noticed that like many of the advances of artificial neural networks, uh, and they're now used for more and more applications. Like from all the way back from like you know image classification using the deep neural networks to now image generation, which we all know about using GANs, VAEs, and more recently these diffusion models. Um, deep networks are used in machine translations and also in like large language models like BERT and GPT and so on. And like these models can not only be used for like things like transcribing voice dialogues, but also they can use to generate sounds as well. So recently, they, they have also been applied to these NERF models that can learn to stitch together uh, these uh, real photographs based on the coordinates and the angles uh, and reconstruct things and maps that look like a 3D map of San Francisco. So I thought like this, this was a pretty cool, cool application of, of these, uh, these uh, deep learning uh, technologies uh, that we've seen recently. But uh, with all of these advances, these really impressive feats in deep learning involve a lot of sophisticated engineering design. Like, for example, even this network, uh, the famous AlexNet, which made headlines and actually made deep learning famous when it won the ImageNet 2012 competition. That's like 10 years ago. And, and we can see that the, you know, the details of its design were, were quite involved. And as we know, modern networks are even much more sophisticated and require like a, a very sophisticated pipeline that spans things like neural network architecture, careful training schemes, tuning hyperparameters. Uh, you know, if, if many of you are doing a PhD in machine learning and deep learning, you all know that there's tons of sweat and labor that you have to do to make all of these amazing results. And, and it's, it's hard work. So uh, as many of you know, recently, I've been really fascinated with all of these large and medium-sized text-to-image models, such as like uh, OpenAI's DALI 2, Google's Imagen, Crayon's da DALI Mini, and now Stability AI's uh, Stable Diffusion. You know, they, they can do things that look like magic, like, like generating an image of uh, you know, an anime scene of Rihanna as a space pilot in the style of Studio Ghibli. Right. And, and these are pretty legit results. So it's, it's magic to me that, that they work at all. And, and I think you know, these results demonstrate how effective deep learning networks are as these like a large neural data sponge that can absorb huge amounts of data into the parameters of neural networks and work with that data in non-trivial ways. You know, just like you know, text to image as a form of uh, uh, image retrieval or image generation. But you know, under the hood, even these diffusion types or, or text to image models require uh, very detailed training schemes. Like there's a recent uh, paper from NVIDIA that, that looks at the specifics of how, how they, the time steps should be stepped, uh, sets, what, what schemes should be used, and, and all of these little tr these tricks that, that need to be used for effective diffusion models. So even in these models, they require quite a bit of uh, engineering. So in this talk, uh, I believe that the way we're currently doing deep learning is like engineering. Like there's nothing wrong with it, but I think we're the way we're building neural network systems is just fundamentally the same way that we're building bridges and buildings. So I really like this quote from Andrew Pickering from this book about uh, the field of cybernetics, where he says, uh, bridges and buildings are all designed to be indifferent to their environment, to withstand fluctuations, not to adapt to them. The best bridge is one that just stands there, uh, whatever the weather. But in natural systems where collective intelligence plays, a, uh, intelligence plays a role, we see these complex designs that emerge due to self-organization. And such designs are usually really sensitive and responsive to changes in the world around them. Natural systems adapt and be a part of their environment. So, but it didn't really have to be this way. 
I think the reason deep learning took its course could just become like one of the paths of history. Like it could be arbitrary. Like in fact, in the very early days of neural network development from the 1980s, many groups, including the group led by Leon Chua, who is this legendary electrical engineer who invented the Memristor, uh, they worked on neural networks that are much closer to these uh, natural adaptive systems. Uh, his group developed something called the cellular neural networks, so not to the not to be confused with CNNs like ConfNets, uh, which are uh, artificial neural network circuits with grids of artificial neurons. So each of these neurons would receive signals from their neighbors, perform a weighted sum operation, and apply a nonlinear activation function. So it's kind of like how we do today. And, and the, each neuron would send a signal off to its neighbors. But the difference between these networks and today's deep learning networks is that they were built with analog circuits, meaning that they, they, they would work only approximately, but at the time also much faster than digital circuits. But more importantly, uh, the wiring of each cell is exactly the same. So they have the same like uh, cellular structure, uh, the same even weights per se. What's remarkable is that even in the late 80s, uh, these networks can be shown to produce amazing results such as like object extraction. Right? These analog networks can work in nanoseconds, something that were only possible and were able to match decades later with digital circuits, with GPUs. They can also be programmed to do non-trivial things like for instance, select all the objects in a pixel image that are pointing up and erasing all of the other objects. So we were only able to do these tasks only decades later with deep learning. But in the last few years, I've been noticing many works in the deep learning research pop up that have been using some of these ideas from collective intelligence. In particular, the area of emerging complex systems, emergence complex systems. Recently, uh, we even wrote a survey paper about these works, which I will discuss in this talk. But the problem is that uh, collective intelligence and complex systems is a huge topics, including topics that investigate behavior of actual honeybees and uh, biological ant colonies. So we will limit our discussion in only some areas focused on machine learning, namely image processing, generative models, deep RL, uh, multi-agent learning, and meta-learning. So we'll start by discussing the idea of image generation from a collective intelligence standpoint. Uh, one example is pretty fun that I can think of is this annual Reddit R place experiment. Uh, in this annual experiment or game, they set up, uh, Reddit sets, sets up a, a pixel canvas that's 1000 by 1000 pixels wide, so a million pixels. Uh, they allow each Reddit user to draw only a single pixel every five minutes. So they can only draw one pixel every five minutes. And this experiment lasts for a week, allowing millions of Redditors to draw whatever they want. But to make something meaningful, users have to like uh, learn to collaborate and coordinate some strategy on the Reddit discussion forum to defend their design because there's limited real estate. They, they also attack other designs and even form alliances with other designs. So this is kind of like a prime example of, a, of this collective system. But early algorithms also computed designs on a pixel grid. Like a simple example of cellular automata is Conway's Game of Life, where the state of each pixel on a grid is computed based on a function that depends on the states of its neighbors from the previous time step. And based on simple rules, complex patterns can emerge like these. A recent work called a neurocellular automata tried to extend the concept of CAs, but replaced the simple rules with a neural network. So in a sense, it's really similar to the cellular neural networks from the 1980s that I discussed earlier. But in this work, they applied neural CAs to image generation, just like the Reddit R place experiment uh, example, where at each time step, a pixel will be randomly chosen and updated based on the output of a single neural network function, whose inputs are only the values of the pixel's immediate neighbors. So over time, they showed that the neural CA can be trained to output any particular given design, like a given drawing, based on a sparse stochastic sampling rule uh, and an almost 
empty initial canvas. But here are some examples of uh, three neural CAs producing three de designs. Uh, what's remarkable, I think, about this method is that even when we see some corruption in the image, the algorithm would attempt to regenerate the corrupt part automatically in its own way. It's kind of like it has an in innate or inductive bias to do things like in painting. So neural CAs can also perform prediction tasks in a collective fashion. For example, they can be applied to classify MNIST digits. Uh, but the difference here between a traditional MNIST classifier is that each pixel must produce its own prediction based on its own pixel. So it can only see its own pixel and also see the predictions from its immediate neighbors. So, so its own prediction can be influenced uh, by the predictions of its neighbors too. And, and each, each classifier at each pixel, pixel can change their opinions over time, just kind of like in some democratic society. Uh, over time, usually some consensus is made across a collection of pixels. Uh, like you know, whether this is an eight or, or a two or a six. But, but sometimes we see interesting effects. Like if the digit is written in a weird way, there could be different steady states of predictions across different regions of the digits. So they, they, they just continue disagreeing. But neural cellular automata, neural CAs are not confined to generating pixels. They can also use to generate voxels and 3D shapes. A uh, recent work also extended neural CAs to produce designs in Minecraft, which are sort of like pixels or voxels. Uh, they can produce things like you know, buildings and trees. But what's more interesting and fun is that, like, since the components of Minecraft are active rather than passive, like they can move, they can also generate functional machines with behavior. So here they show that uh, when one of these functional machines get cut in half each half can regenerate itself morphogenetically uh, to end up with two functional machines, each that can move forward. So, so they, they cut the, the, the worm in half and, and each of them regenerates. And then, and then both of them can, can continue uh, doing, doing its thing. So uh, let me move to another popular area of deep learning, which is a deep reinforcement learning. When we want to train neural networks uh, with reinforcement learning for tasks like uh, local motion control. Uh, here are a few examples of these uh, so-called uh, Mujoko humanoid benchmark environments and their state-of-the-art solutions. Uh, what usually happens is that all of these input states, uh, in this case of the humanoid, there are 376 observations are fed into this uh, deep neural network, the policy network. And this policy network will output all 17 actions required to control all the joints of the humanoid for it to move forward. So you can imagine that like, uh, because uh, there's only one neural network taking all of the inputs and outputting all of the output at once. Uh, what usually happens is that these networks tend to overfit to the training environment. So you end up with solutions that only work for this exact design and this exact environment and, and can't really work uh, and when, when there's small deviations uh, to the environments. So we've seen some pretty cool works recently that looked at an alternative collective controller approach for these pro problems. Uh, so rather than having like one giant network, uh, they try to break, break up the, the controller into, into like a, a collection of, of different policies that are that are the same. So what I mean is in particular in, in this paper, uh, they propose that rather than having one policy network take all of the inputs and output all of the actions here, they use a single shared policy network for every joint in the agents, effectively decomposing an agent into a collection of agents interconnected by limbs, uh, by, by their limbs. So these policies can communicate bidirectionally to each other with their neighbors. Uh, so over time, uh, uh, the, the hope is that a global policy can emerge uh, that controls the entire uh, robot uh, just from this local coordination. So there, there's no central policy in this case, just a bunch of decentralized policies. So they show that uh, what's remarkable is that not only can they train this single policy 
uh, shared policy for one agent design, uh, they, also, they also must get it working, uh, the same policy across dozens of designs in a training set uh, with the same weights. So here, uh, every one of these agents are controlled by the same policy network that governs each joint. They show that this type of uh, collective system has some zero-shot generalization capabilities and can also control agents with not only different design variations with different limb lengths and masses, but also novel designs uh, not in the training set and also deal with unforeseen challenges, like un unseen challenges, like you know, having a ball. Well, uh, why rely on a fixed design? So here's another work that looks at why not have the limbs figure out a way to self-assemble into some design to perform tasks like balancing and locomotion. In this work, uh, they show that this uh, self-assembly approach can generalize to cases even when you have double or half the number of limbs the system was trained on, something that's simply not possible with traditional deep learning uh, or deep RL. Even a system trained with deep, uh, traditional deep RL would work uh, for, for a fixed number of lengths uh, of limbs, but the self-assembling solution consistently uh, is shown to be more robust to unseen challenges, like if the authors add wind or in the case of locomotion and handle new types of terrain such as hurdles and, and stairs, uh, these are things that the traditional RL systems uh, cannot generalize to. So, this type of uh, collective policy making uh, can, the concept can also be applied to image based RL tasks too. So in a recent NeurIPS paper from my group, uh, led by Eugene Tang, uh, we looked at feeding each patch of a video feed into an identical sensory neuron unit. And these sensory neurons must uh, figure out the context of their own input channel and then self organize using an attention mechanism for communication to collectively output motor commands for this agent. So this will allow the agent to still work even when the patches on the screen are shuffled and reshuffled during the life uh, of, of, the, of the task. So this work was inspired by the idea of a sensory substitution where different parts of the brain can be retrained to process different sensory modal modalities, enabling us to adapt our senses to crucial information sources. As an example, uh, applied to a locomotion task like this ant agent, we can shuffle the ordering of the 28 inputs uh, quite frequently. And as you can see here, our agent quickly adjusts to a dynamic observation space on the left. We can even get this agent to play like a, a puzzle pong game where all the patches are constantly shuffled and reshuffled. Like it, it's, it was amazing that this worked at all. Uh, we, can, we also show in the paper that this system uh, can also work with partial information, like with only 70% of the patches, uh, not all of the information, which are also shuffled. Uh, the patches are also randomly, uh, randomly chosen as well uh, of, of the 70%. We found some unexpected uh, benefits from this system too, like the ability to work with different backgrounds that it hasn't seen during training. Because it, here, it's only seen the green grass background in this environment. So the earlier reinforcement learning examples that I discussed were mainly about decomposing a single agent into a smaller collection of agents. But what we do know from complex systems is that emergence often occurs at much larger scales than simply 10 to 20 agents. Perhaps we need a collection of thousands or even more individual agents to interact meaningfully for these complex superorganisms to emerge. A few years back, there was a paper that looked at taking advantage of hardware accelerators like GPUs to enable significant scale up of uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. In this work called M Agents, they propose a framework to get up to a million agents, uh, though pretty simple ones, to engage in various grid world multi-agent environments. And furthermore, they, they can have one population of agents pit against another population of agents in a collective self-play manner. Uh, the hardware revolution brought about by deep learning can enable us to take advantage of the hardware and use them to train truly large scale collective behavior. In some of these experiments, uh, they observe these uh, predator prey loops 
and encirclement tactics emerge from truly large-scale multi-agent RL. So these macro-level collective intelligence will probably not emerge from traditional small-scale multi-agent environments. I would like to note that the work was from 2018, and hardware acceleration progress has only exponentially increased since then. A recent demo from NVIDIA last year showed that a physics engine can now handle thousands of agents acting in realistic physics simulation, like unlike the simple grid world environment. I believe that in the future, we can see really interesting studies of emergent behavior using these newer technologies. Uh, the last section, I'll end with a discussion of how collective behavior is up being applied to meta-learning. Uh, these increases in compute capabilities, I think, won't just stop at simulation. Uh, we all know that a simple MNIST classifier network does not require much hardware anyways. And since our conception of uh, artificial neural networks are pretty simple. It's based on a simple weighted matrices between a node and a nonlinear activation function. But with extra compute, we can also explore really interesting directions where we can simulate generalized versions of neural networks, where every neuron is an identical multi-layer artificial neural network. I remember seeing actually some neuroscience papers exploring this theme of modeling a biological neuron with, with, a deep, like, with a deep network. But rather than neurons though, recently we have seen some pretty ambitious works modeling the synapse of every artificial neural network as a recurrent neural network. So this is because when we look at how a standard neural network is trained, we go through a forward pass of the network to forward propagate the inputs of the network to the output. And then we use the back propagation an algorithm to backprop the error signals back from the output all the way to the input. And this backprop algorithm allows us to compute the gradients to adjust the weights. But here, rather than relying on this forward and back propagation, uh, we can model each synapse of a neural network with a recurrent neural network, uh, which is a universal computer. So in principle, it can learn how to best forward and back propagate the signals or learning how to learn. So basically it learns to figure out how to change its own weights uh, in order to learn. Uh, in, in essence, the hidden states of each RNN would define what the weights are in a highly plastic way. Uh, recent works have also shown that these approaches are a generalization of back prop. Uh, the authors also experimentally trained these meta learning networks to exactly like, uh, replicate the back propagation algorithm, including gradient computation. And they show that they can learn to exactly replicate SGD uh, and also Adam. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they can also evolve rules that can learn even more efficiently than SGD and Adam. In one example, they trained this type of meta-learning system called a variable shared meta-learner, uh, the blue line, uh, to learn something, uh, to learn a learning rule uh, using only the MNIST data set, where the learning here outperforms uh, standard SGD and Adam, uh, which is expected since the learning rule is fine-tuned to the MNIST data set. But when they test this learning rule, this plastic learning rule, uh, of the dynamic synapse to a new data set like the fashion MNIST, they see per similar performance gains. But I would like to note that these works are still in their very early stages, it's still in the infancy. And I think these approaches of modeling neural networks as a truly collective set of identical neurons or synapse rather than like unique weights are a really promising direction that will really change the subfield of meta learning. So, as an aside, I also think. These, these uh, algorithms could perhaps even be combined with like large neural networks uh, or with large language models where like certain layers have these meta-learning features and certain layers are, are fixed. So I view something like a large language model as like a long-term memory and these kind of uh, smart networks are the short-term memory that can adapt really quickly. And it'll be interesting to see works in the future that combine uh, these meta learners with, uh, with large models going forward. So in summary, uh, in this talk, you know, I, I talked about how collective intelligence can really help move the needle in machine learning. 
I've shown examples that of systems that can adapt to the environments, uh, systems that are robust to out of distribution shifts, uh, generalization uh, due to uh, as, as a consequence or a byproduct of uh, collective intelligence, uh, something that was not designed for. Uh, and I, th I show that these collective intelligence systems could be a key ingredient for systems that learn to learn. Uh, we recently uh, published this paper called A Collective Intelligence for Deep Learning, a survey of recent developments uh, in the ACM Journal of Collective Intelligence. So if, if you would like to read more, uh, you, can, you can search for this paper, it's open access, and, and there's more works that we have surveyed as well. Okay, so this is the, the end of my talk. And let me, uh, let me close, let me close the sky. Yeah. Okay, stop sharing. Thank you very okay. much for the uh, talk, David. Finish. Cool. So it is. So yeah, yeah maybe, maybe this this talk might not have too much to do with you know, what you guys are working on. <laughs> no, it was still very fascinating, nevertheless. And I mean, our long-term plans at CARPA are like very general, smart assistants. So I think. I think the, the relevance is actually maybe a little bit higher than expected. Yeah, you, you figure like if, if you're training like a large language models uh, to be a smart assistant where like uh, you, you think it, it should be able to adapt to the user and, and maybe certain states can, can automatically change the context, but perhaps adding some of these uh, uh, meta learning elements might, might make the adaptation more robust in, in mm -hmm. a sense. So, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, yeah, yeah cause like, uh, because like you, if, if we have a chat bot, like uh, the, the, it's still, you know, it's sometimes it may struggle with remembering the context because it's not allowed to change its own weights. It, it can only change uh, the, the internal states if there is one in the architecture. Uh, whereas something like this could enable a simple feed forward network to, to just um, to change its own weights uh, during inference, uh, which which opens up uh, like a like a, a whole set of possibilities, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, does anyone have uh, questions for David? Uh, I have a couple. If no one else, um, oh, I guess I can ask one right now and then. Maybe someone else can go. So uh, first, maybe a silly question, but I feel like I've looked up, like I've read about meta learning once or twice, but I still don't have a good grasp of what meta learning is. So do you think you can just like give a quick definition? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what, like uh, it should be simple, but the definition has been evolved in the machine learning community because like uh, they've molded the definition to fit to certain benchmark task of machine learning mm. conferencing. Like, like now when people talk about meta learning is about, okay, let's, let's try to, you know, use some algorithm like memo or, or something to, to you, you have a training data set and you have a test data set, but it's much more simple than that. I think the a meta learning algorithm is just the ability to the algorithm to, to learn how to learn or how, how to adjust its own uh, model parameters. Um, to fit the task at hand, uh, without us, uh, the, the human user, um, you know, like explicitly setting the the learning algorithm. Like, like for for example, the, in the example that I, I pointed out, like uh, we we don't let the algorithm know about the existence of the back propagation algorithm, which is like the algorithm that's like a hard coded for our neural networks to learn, and and this method has to figure out uh, how to do something like backprop. So I, I would say something like that, uh, you know, like a learning how to learn, uh, it would should be considered to be the definition of meta learning. I guess in that context, I'm wondering how do you train the meta learner though? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is interesting. Like the, the meta learner can still be trained using backprop. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Right, or evolution, yeah, <laughs> or anything we want. Because uh, in, in the case that I mentioned, uh, you, you replace, 
you, you have a very simple MNIST classification feed forward network. But, but every synapse, rather than have been a, a floating point number, like a weights, uh, yeah. every synapse is a recurrent neural network. And they're the identical recurrent neural network mm -hmm. uh, with the same weights, but just with different internal states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the, it will have to learn to, to get the, the errors, like the, the, the classification errors, and how to use those classification errors in a collective way uh, mm -hmm. to adjust its, each of their own internal states uh, so that the, the weights that they, they produce for, for that feed forward network will maximize the classification accuracy for MNIST. So that makes me wonder, since we're still being reduced to like a, you know, at, at its core, the learning algorithm is still backpack based. Uh, like how, well, maybe- I mean, uh, it, it could be evolution based as well. They, or, they tried yeah, both yeah. in this paper. And, and evolution is like, I guess from, from nature, it was how we evolved our own like learning algorithms. I guess it makes me wonder though, like how much of these, I guess, heuristics are being implemented uh, implicitly when we do backprop on like deep neural networks, right? Because you can imagine that something similar is happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like in, in this case, like what what's interesting is like uh, they they wanted because they needed to compare themselves uh, with backprop. That's like, that's the points, like mm -hmm. whether you can learn a better learning algorithm than backprop. So to your point, they do in that experiment, they want to structure it so that in theory, um, the system can, can be shown to learn something that exactly replicates backprop. But because of that requirements, uh, maybe the, the, the system or the architecture is set up so that like um, there's a human bias. Uh, in, in the way it's set up so that uh, there's certain elements of backprop that can be uh, introduced to the structure of the meta learning system. Mm -hmm. And that could be a weakness. But in, in principle, though, if you if you're don't need to compare to backprop, then I don't see any reason to enforce these biases. And perhaps even uh, not, not having, having to, like, uh, if they don't even need to show the comparison to backprop, uh, you you might even you know like get even better results. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Because backprop a lot, like you, you actually need a the certain time steps to and I think they replicated that. Uh, sorry, uh, there's another question. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to, to interrupt you. Um, I was just kind of curious, um, somewhat related to that. Like, do you know if there's any work uh, that discusses like formally what the expressiveness of evolution-based uh, learning is compared to um, either like traditional backpropagation or other kinds of learning. Because like there is some, for example, like work on the expressiveness of transformers compared to RNNs and LSTMs. And I'm kind of curious, like is, um, is this just, a more expressive class of models? Is there a way to emulate uh, evolution using, um, like, like essentially emulate the process using uh, other kinds of architecture? Uh, yeah, that kind of, yeah. yeah that, that's a good question. I, I think like, so in the context of the meta learning system that I described uh, in these works, uh, the authors compared the approach of training the meta learners using evolution or backprop, and they get roughly the same results. So, it, like in these cases specifically, I don't think these works are about evolution versus backprop. They're about the they're about the meta learning architecture versus a traditional one. So, in that sense, uh, what your point, the point you brought up, is is interesting because, like, perhaps we, like, uh, we is. Can we, for example, rather than have explicitly defining this system to be this collective RNN system where you have an explicit weight sharing, uh, you have the same RNN for every uh, weights or every every synapse, can we just replace the entire thing with a, with a giant transformer and have it learn to to be uh, 
to be this collective system. And that perhaps that'll work as well. Uh, because like it can be shown that like in in the transformer model, uh, there there's a many symmetries there, and in a sense that like uh, if if you remove the the positional embedding, it, it is quite similar to to a, a collective system. You, there's lots of like identical shared elements, and and I, I haven't seen any works that explores like whether whether a, a transformer system um can can explicitly you know like uh like just just do do collective intelligence well i mean one of the work we talked about in the slides does that but but i haven't seen like many other works that discuss the same thing but your other point about evolution how expressive it is i mean i think it depends on the problem like ev evolution is not good like it sucks when you're when you need to solve for like like a billion different weight values but but in this particular problem domain uh, of of collective intelligence, uh, it 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 actually makes uh, something like an evolution algorithm shine because you're essentially uh, like in traditional deep learning, your complexity level is at the architecture level where you're solving for a billion weights. But something here, you dial up the complexity, so you increase the complexity of your individual units but decrease the complexity of the global unit. So before you have like say uh, a billion weights uh, and you use SGD to solve for billion weights. Here, you could have like, like a million uh, meta weights, each of them the same, but you have a thousand connections. Uh, so in a sense, uh, then something like evolution would train for much smaller parameters uh, at, the, at the modular level, but that will be replicated uh, across your entire system a million times. So in that sense, something like evolution uh, would perform quite well uh, you know, uh, in compared to a large number of parameters. Interesting. I hadn't really thought about that kind of a uh, trade-off perspective. That makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of related then, like from the perspective of collective intelligence and complexity, it seems like, like I wonder if there's, um, a benefit or use for any of the like classical statistical works that that try to give like formal definitions of, of these qualities like is it enough to to kind of look qualitatively and say like this is interesting collective emergent behavior uh, at, at scale or um for example like Cosma Schlitzi had a bunch of work like 20 years ago 10 15 years ago uh about trying to provide like information theoretic definitions of emergence and self-organization and collective um, interaction at scale. And I'm kind of curious, like, is there basically, is it enough to just have this be complex and look at the downstream capability of emergent behavior? Or is there, do you think there's a utility in like finding the, the kind of, uh, quantitative levels of self-organization and emergence in these systems and, um, you know, act evaluating along that axis as well. well that, that's a great question. Uh, you no, know, cause like, uh, it is one that I don't think we know right now, because uh, as, as I mentioned, like uh, many of these works are just starting to explore uh, using collective intelligence for deep learning, uh, and, and beyond like, uh, haven't really looked into the traditional like a uh, literature of the information theory, which there's a there's an abundance of literature on information theory about studying like uh, the the life or even even or, or even looking at like a uh, what is what the level of uh, of complexity required to reach emergence. So perhaps there could there would be utility to dig into the theory to see if. Uh, if these would help our understanding or improve the results, but I don't think we're we're there yet. This is still in the early stages. But at another level, though, this this also links to the the broader discussion in deep learning. So you know, deep learning, there's like deep learning theory and and so on. But like there's also a debate about whether you know the deep learning theory substantially adds to to the state of the art of deep learning or whether it's like, you know, GPUs go burr and then you just like get stuff to work. So I, I think it, it, we don't know that there's, there may be in complex systems, uh, it's, it's worthwhile to, to look 
in a more more structured information theoretical way as well. So so I think uh, you know that is something good to think about. There's a few questions in the uh, chat that I wanted to read first. So, oh, Thomas, hi. Do you want to read your question? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so you, the uh, the RNN synapses, they made me think of hyper networks. I know it's yeah. not the exact same thing, uh, but you know, I just was wondering if maybe that you had also thought of something similar. Maybe you could do a little compare and contrast uh, since you're the expert. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, like uh, the the concept of hyper networks, uh, where uh, like basically you you have a network that produces the the weights of a larger network. Uh, it has been shown. I think even you know, from the last question, there has been a theoretical analysis to show that this property uh, can exponentially increase the the uh, expressivity of the network. So, like, uh, compared to adding more layers or increasing the depth or the width, so so the ability to have one structure generate the weights uh, of a nonlinear structure is very useful. And I think something like uh, the the RNN based synapse is is a special form of hypernetworks uh, where you're constrained to have an, one single RNN produce the weights of locally uh, for that. Uh, it, and in fact. Um, like the, the work I described called a variable shared met, meta learner, uh, like uh, this is a recent work, but but it was based on a Schmidt Huber paper. You know, surprise surprise, uh, twenty years ago without the variable shared. So that was like the hyper network style, and and but they showed that th having this variable shared like a collective system allowed the system not to overfit and generalize to other data sets. So it can generalize from MNIST to fashion MNIST. But if you remove the sharing, if you allow every synapse to have its own weights, like a complete decoupling, obviously it will just completely overfit the learning rule to MNIST and overfit it to DEF, and it will not generalize to another data sets. Awesome, thank you. That's exactly the treatment I was looking for. Appreciate it. Thanks. There was another question uh, from Danny. Oh yeah, okay. He's gonna. Question as well. All right, take over. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to format it a little better. So I, I feel like there's there's all these um, examples of almost like population based decision making. You know, like um, potentially the brain, right? Has like Jeff Hawkins from Hawkins from Nementa's theory about you know thousands of models voting, right? Uh, the wisdom of the crowds and all this stuff, and so. I, like me personally, I see a lot of potential in more like collective intelligence, more population-based methods, but it doesn't seem like it drives very well with the hardware constraints or yeah. where things yeah. are. So I was just curious your thoughts on actual like implementation or engineering around some of that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a great point, and and I think this is going to be a challenge uh, in the future. Like basically, I think that the current deep learning paradigm is intertwined with the development of GPUs. Uh, it's essentially what like uh, my colleague Sarah Hooker described as the hardware lottery, right? So so they uh, GPUs won the hardware lottery, and it's like a self fulfilling feedback loop. So there's a self improvement on each side, and I, and like uh, I think GPUs in for some aspects are good for this uh, collective intelligence style uh, method, but, but in, in some sense it, it's not. I, I think uh, the, the ideal limitations of the world that would benefit from collective intelligence are when there are huge bottlenecks of uh, communication constraints. So, and GPUs don't have that because they can just communicate. Uh, NVIDIA even have the NV link to link multiple GPUs together to get around that. But I, I think uh, where we will eventually see these uh, models uh, shine is like w as I think uh, as models become so-called decentralized uh, in in the next few years, like when when we move away from like having a, a single server serve a giant model. Uh, there's even works on right now on serving the Bloom model across GPUs we're going to get into limitations where like you actually need ways of getting these things to work with huge huge constraints and and the thing is like i, I guess like the way we evolve uh, as a species is 
because our, our brain operates on 30 watts or something like that uh, is because like there's huge sparsity and and the, the communication you know there's so many constraints and and these are like you know gpus because of commercial success uh, we don't want those constraints we want to render stuff really fast right so i, I think we're going to run into these constraints and these methods perhaps uh, will be their turn to shine, but we, we don't know for sure. sure. But like my, I think one of one of the the dream is to not only have uh, models be decentralized and open source, but to also have the training and serving to be decentralized in the future. So may, maybe there's an active area of research. Good stuff. Yes. How's the time? How's the time? It's almost an hour. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? Uh, I have something else. Go for it. So going back to, I guess, the first topic you presented, which was, I guess, uh, design via this collective intelligence in like either pixel space or voxel space. <laughs> um, I guess like something that is super useful to know in general is if I give you a rule for how the, I guess, um, agents communicate, can we then predict what the emergent structure will be? Like I assume that's in the paper to some degree, but it seems like an important question to answer. Yeah, and I think uh, based, uh, like uh, based on what I know, like I don't, like I could be wrong, but what's interesting is like predicting whether emergence can emerge or not, uh, not even predicting the structure, uh, it's something like an impossible task. Uh, if, if we read the, in, in, the, in the complex systems literature that like what, what's really fascinating about the emergent phenomenon is they cannot be predicted. I, I don't know if, if you read, uh, uh, what's it called, the, not, not Stephen Hawking, the, the uh, uh, it's, it's called a, the, this rule, uh, the book of rules. That you know, there's rule one seventeen. Uh, like a uh, like in the game of life. New, or... Yeah, the new. Uh, oh, new the new, this new science by Stephen Wolfram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Stephen Wolfram. Yeah, Wol Wolfram's rules. So, so Wolfram has a scheme where you know it's it's not invented by him, but he took the name because he likes to take credits. But there, there's like a, a, a system, it's a it's a one D system uh, of of grid. It's, it's even it's more simple than Conway's Game of Life. And and you can you see these if they if there's emergence that happens, uh, you see these triangle things show up. You know, and they they uh, they show that that they're you can't really predict. Uh, uh, over, uh, it, it's like a, some extremely difficult problem to predict the 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 color or or, or the state of the pixel uh, two hundred time steps on. It's like it's almost like a random number generator. Mm -hmm. And and furthermore, uh, they, he has like if you read that uh, book, they, he classifies I think four types of systems like things that die out really quickly, things that blow up, and and uh, somewhere in the middle is like things that uh, uh, or things that keep on repeating in a really boring way, and and the 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 thing uh, the thing that the the system that's most complicated is the last one that's uh, at the edge of chaos. So the one is very chaotic, but at the edge of chaos is when you actually have the emergence property uh, of, of things that uh, uh, have have patterns, but but the patterns are not predictable, but they're 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 there. So, so you, even like what's, what's phenomenal is like even such a very simple system from Wolfram's experiment shows that like how, how difficult it is to predict things. And, and this, this stems from the literature on, um, on chaos theory as well. Like, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, there was uh, the, uh, the, the agreement amongst uh, the physicists that, okay, we, we solve physics, everything can be simulated and predicted to infinite precision. But it turns out that, like you know, that's not true. There's there are very simple systems where you have very small deviations, and and even after ten time steps, uh, you have the butterfly effect, and and it's it's so difficult to predict, you know, like uh, even after ten or twenty time steps. And I think at a at a at a comp complicated scale that this is what's happening in two D space for for some of these uh, 
uh, uh, complex systems where you can have a very simple rule, but but the, the one of the reasons why I'm I'm so excited about complex systems is like because exactly because such very simple rules can produce such unpredictable and complex behavior, and I, I think you know as a as a scientist that that's something like you know really worth worth uh, studying about like uh, trying to to grasp or or understand like uh, what what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the temporal component is very interesting. Uh, I guess to kind of push back on this, though, I mean, we do have some tools for analyzing these chaotic systems, though. Like ergodic theory has been huge yeah. in the last, you know, couple of decades. So I, I do wonder if there is yeah. something we can do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think like uh, perhaps uh, at the macro level, people they can un like they can predict. Uh, like if if you look at uh, a, a similar problem, something like a weather prediction, uh, where you, you take the signals from weather stations and you, you uh, uh, and lots of data to predict what's going to happen next. Well, they cannot predict exactly due to the chaos, uh, what's going to happen exactly when. But there's still like, uh, as you pointed out, like there, there's still tools for predicting with high accuracy that a storm mm -hmm. will happen with a high probability even six, even even maybe two weeks out or something like that mm -hmm. uh, for certain regions. So so yeah, I think uh, maybe at the at some macro level, uh, the, we can we can do prediction. Uh, and and when when like the, the it's easier to predict the super organism moving around than than the micro components. I, I guess. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I have another question, but if anyone has a question before that, I'll let them go. Okay, so uh, you're, I, I thought this during the talk and your discussion of brief discussion of weather makes me wonder this again, but I wonder how much of this uh, research on collective intelligence can be tied into kind of this hugely, like fastly growing area of uh, causal reinforcement learning and like causal world models. Because um, it seems like there are a lot of similarities because uh, causal world models, like I guess the pitch for them is that they uh, like result in really good generalizability of properties across like for reinforcement learning agents across different domains, right? Because you have like a robust causal world model, which is, uh, you know, doesn't care about irrelevant um, variations in your environment. And it seems like something similar is happening here where, okay, clearly you have very nice generalization properties for the RL agents that you get uh, when you train them collectively. So I'm wondering if you've seen any kind of connections between these two fields. Yeah, like surprisingly, no. Uh, I like actually yeah, when you raise that up, like I, that was actually surprising to me. Like me, I I would even like intuitively something like a causal ML or causal RL, I would think could be could be orthogonal to to you know complex systems uh, because. Because like a, a lot of these complex systems lead to systems that are that have the problems of machine learning, like like uh, like uh, spurious correlations. Like there's nothing stopping uh, this uh, this complex systems, uh, you know, like this collective intelligence from learning something like a Hebbian rule, right? Where mm -hmm. where you would just associate events that happen together to to act together. Whereas like something like causal learning, you actually actively try to identify the cause and the effect. Uh, and, and humans are like, honestly, we're not so good at, at, uh, at causal like uh, inference ourselves, yeah. uh, biological species. And then we, we are the products of, of, uh, of these like uh, complex emergence. So, so I, I, that, that's surprising to me. I, I honestly, I, I have never thought about that. Uh, and and may, maybe there's a connection but, but I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering because I mean the reason I ask is because it seems like they have uh, similar downstream effects. So. Yeah, there, there's a there's a review paper about RL generalization, and the author put a few works uh, that I discussed uh, in this talk uh, with generalization properties, and and I think uh, what's interesting is they they compare 
different approaches coming from entirely different assumptions, uh, each of which have some uh, benefits to certain types of generalization. Mm -hmm. And so uh, like maybe maybe they have an underlying, they're doing the same thing, or maybe they're doing something orthogonal, which is might be better than, than like uh, maybe the, that, that can even bring about stronger capabilities in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in out of the domain uh, distribution, which, which is like, it's all about out of the domain. Uh, like for, if we want to have a strong AI, it's the, the key issue is handling out of the domain uh, scenarios anyways. Yes, it should be able to operate in the snow, for example. That's important. Yeah. Okay, well, I think okay. that is all my questions, so thank you. Cool, thanks. And uh, it's, uh, it's one hour, so I think uh, this is uh, the, the good time. Thank you, David, for giving a, giving a talk. It was great. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for organizing, Louis. Well, I'll catch yeah. you guys later. Yeah, yeah see you later. Yeah, see Bye. You. Thanks, Alex. See you. See you, Thomas.